Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for another day today to be alive and to get, be gathered together like this for your purposes, to learn your word uh, this very day and what you have for us right now to go forward in your plan for our lives. We thank you that you value each every and every day that we gather together. We thank you that you provide for us each and every day, and also that you tell us to take one day at a time per your precious son's words. Father, we ask right now that you bless this message, that you guide us and teach us what we need to hear through your Holy Spirit. And we ask all of these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Okay, the book of Hebrews, part 111. We started on Sunday with the idea that love motivates gratitude. And also, gratitude is a response to receiving love. You know, pastor was talking about how when you, when you have certain love in your life from certain people, you're, you're grateful that, that you just have them in your life. And I was writing my notes. These things, love and gratitude, are so intimately tied together. As I was writing my notes, I kept flip-flopping the words. I was like, wait a minute, which one motivates which? You know what I mean? Which one comes from which almost? And they're not exactly the same, but they are really tied closely together. So kind of a summary of, of the opening from Sunday might be this. When you realize and appreciate someone else's love for you, you can't help but be grateful. And that's what God wants from us, to see how much he loved us, to see how he proved his love for us at the cross by sending his son in the first place. And God wants us to see that and appreciate that and be even overwhelmed with that so that we, you know, can live a grateful, happy life. Not one caring about the details of our own lives. So, of course, this starts with our Lord and Savior and his love. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians 5, 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Again, when you realize and appreciate someone else's love for you, you can't help but be grateful. It kind of overflows out of you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The love God has shown us through Christ makes us so grateful that we no longer even desire to live for ourselves. Amen, somebody? <laughs> right? Like, you almost get to a point where you despise living for yourself. Like, you realize how selfish you can be, uh, you realize how um, futile life is, living for yourself. But to live for him who died in your place brings whole new purpose and meaning, meaning and um, even peace and gratitude. So that comes from the love God has shown us through Christ. It makes us so grateful. We don't even want to live for ourselves anymore. And that's being set free from the flesh, and from the world. It's his love that motivates that grateful way of living. And this is why the cross must stay in our sights at all times. We get in trouble when we take our eyes off the cross, because then we start to forget what he did for us. Go to 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18. cross, the cross, the cross.
For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There's a direct correlation made there. The word of the cross is the power of God. So you want to have his power to get through life? You want to, want to have his um, purpose? Be grateful? It's the word of the cross. Anytime we ponder the cross, our perspective shifts back to where it belongs, where it needs to be. And the love that drove Christ to that cross is the love that drives us to live for him. Right? I mean, that changes everything when you finally realize it when you realize that he did that for you, and even if it was only you, and he did that willingly to take away sin and death once for all. That love drives us to live for him instead of ourselves. On this topic of gratitude, one verse from Sunday really was encouraging from the standpoint of what God wants from us. You know, what does God want from us? Like, if we, what if we had to make a short list? What would we say? Turn again to Psalm 50, 23. Psalm 50, 23. One of the top few items, if we were to narrow it down, is that God wants gratitude from us. He wants thankfulness in our hearts, which in turn sets us free. Psalm 50, 23. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. And this leads us to a key, key principle that came out on Sunday. Throughout the whole Bible, we are told that gratitude and thankfulness glorify God. Isn't it a relief to realize that's what God really wants from us? He wants our hearts, in other words, of course. Psalm 50, 23 says that. And last week we talked about Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's what God really wants from us. He doesn't ask us to get on a works program. He asks us for gratitude. And then let that gratitude motivate you to do whatever you think he wants you to do. But that's what he wants. If the heart isn't right, everything else isn't appropriate, isn't good. So this is what pleases him, a heart of gratitude. And this is also how we're delivered between our own two ears as well. This is God's secret for us, we might say, to save us from ourselves even. Gratitude. You know, it's a good idea to just, when you get ungrateful, to just sit down and, and you know, shut everything off, right? Get alone with God and just start listing things that you should be grateful for. And then after five or ten minutes of that, your head should be back on straight, you know? Start with the five senses that hopefully most of us still all have the use of. Start with the most basic of things, including the air you breathe. And this is a secret that God's given us to save us from ourselves and our own misery. Last week's blog was called, Why an Attitude of Gratitude Rocks. And here's the quote from that again. When you live a life of gratitude, life becomes like a song. It's contagious, too. You sing your way through it in good times and bad because you never lose sight of God's grace. I don't know about you guys, but have you, have you ever, you know, sung one of your favorite hymns in the middle of the day when you're all alone and, and you know, you're thinking about something, you're going through something, you don't know what to do, and you just start the heck with it. I'm just going to sing this, my favorite song, to him and let it out to him. It's almost like relying on his grace. Anyway, the quote goes on. You sing your way through it in good times and bad because you never lose sight of God's grace. To you, nothing else matters but to worship God 
bringing glory to him in the process. Talk about singing your way through it. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 16.22. Acts 16.22. And only grace and love can motivate this kind of gratitude that gives you the power to sing in the middle of a prison situation. The crowd joined him, oh, I'm sorry, the crowd joined in, attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Talk about having no way out, right? But look at verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And we know the rest of the story. The earthquake happened and they got set free. But they were singing. I mean, think of the physical pain and humiliation they went through and a hopeless situation in the inner prison with stocks on your feet. And they were singing. What empowered them to do that? Only the love of God, knowing the love of God, can empower you to have that kind of gratitude that lets you sing in that situation. Why were they joyful in their hearts after being beaten with rods and thrown into prison? Turn to Acts 5.40. Acts 5.40. I never get tired of this verse either because it shows the miracle of having a relationship with God. and what he does in the souls of those who surrender to him. Acts 5.40, And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Rejoicing. <laughs> not, saying, not saying, well, it wasn't that bad, right? Not saying, well, you know, at least we're alive, you know, and, and being um, okay with it, just grateful to be set free. They were rejoicing. I, I personally, in my head, I picture them jumping up and down and going down the street, so to speak, skipping almost, you know what I mean? Like, can you believe this? We just got to go through that for Christ. We know who he is. We know why we went through that. We know it was unfair, but he went through it, and we just got to go through it. They literally were re rejoicing. So last week's blog is so helpful to keep a healthy perspective for us. Again, it also stated an attitude of gratitude is a way of life, not just a once in a while strategy that you rely on when things get bad. It's an I'm going to take every thought captive to Christ attitude. It sets you free to enjoy your life. Go to 2 Corinthians 10.5 one more time. We're spending a lot of time in Corinthians tonight. 2 Corinthians 10.5. We have to do this thing if we're going to maintain our gratitude and not get thrown off track by different thoughts that come at us. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ to obey Christ. When a thought flies into your head, maybe it's a temptation, maybe it's a lie, I don't know, but does that thought obey Christ? If not, I'm going to chain it up. I'm going to make it obey Christ. I'm going to throw it out, as Pastor said on Sunday. Let's be honest. Some days in this corrupt world can drive us crazy. And if we didn't know Christ, we'd be like other people that are just looking for ways of escape, like many unbelievers are understandably doing without Christ. They're just looking for a way of escape, a way to forget it, a way to deny it, etc. But knowing Christ and knowing there's a spiritual battle going on and the kingdom of darkness will purposely try to throw you off and tempt you and overwhelm you, 
this should give us hope. We should see purpose in this. It's actually a form of encouragement to be attacked by the enemy. And here's a key principle to remember. To be attacked by our enemies means we're doing something right. We're on the narrow path of Christ. As in John 15, 18 through 21, when Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If the world hates you, it hated me first. Don't be surprised, in other words. This is how it's supposed to be for now because we're in a real, legitimate, spiritual battle. To be attacked by our enemies means we're doing something right. We're on the narrow path of Christ. Have you ever had everything go wrong in one day, even things that defy like your imagination, like defy logic? Everything goes wrong. That's not a coincidence. You know, even the things that are so simple and plain somehow get twisted or screwed up. That's a sign that you're being attacked, and that's a sign that you're on the right track, that you're following Christ. And this includes the attacks on our thinking, the ones we need to defend or take captive right away when they come. And we rely on God's grace to do this, to give us the power to do this because we can't do it on our own. His grace is sufficient, remember. Oh, how often I forget that in the midst of pressure situations. But it is that simple to come back to that. His grace is sufficient. So you're in, the, you're in this situation that looks kind of hopeless. You'd like to get out of, but, you know, everything's against you. You don't see a way out. And it's in that moment we need to pause and say, wait a minute, his grace is sufficient. I'm willing to stay right here, Lord, if you want me to stay right here. Because your grace is sufficient. It always is. He never gives us more than we can handle. Even though we think we can't handle it, he knows better than us. And our part is to lean on his grace with all our heart in those situations. And only God's power can help you defeat the enemy and resist temptation of running away, for example. And God is so faithful. Even in the testings and temptations, he provides the way to victory for us. It may not come right away. He might want you to sit there for a while. Like Job had to sit on the ash heap and scrape his boils for nine months. He might want you to sit there for a while so that you come to the realization that His grace really is sufficient. And as we're going to see right now, that doesn't come by getting out of it. It comes by going through it and staying in it. Because if you don't stay in it, you don't come to that realization. So this is what He's trying to work out in us and um, bring Him glory, glory to Himself at the same time. So here's a key principle we're going to spend a little time on tonight. God provides not the way out, but the way through it to the glory of his grace. Again, God provides not the way out, but the way through it to the glory of his grace. 2 Corinthians 10, 13, you can turn there again. And then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12. But go to um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Anyone can have faith when things are going well. But what good is faith if it doesn't get us through tough times? God lets us go through testing so the proof of our faith can shine through in this dark world. Again, all to his glory. What shining is there going to be if there's not a dark situation? Or people don't see you in a prison like Paul and Silas. What, where's, the, where's the, the, the shining? Where's the miracle? Where's the peace in your soul that is the miracle that they need to see when everything's going wrong? So let's compare some scriptures on this note which should encourage us to win the daily battles because of how God's plan is designed for us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, first of all. 
No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He does not provide the way of escape that you may be able to get out of it right away. It says He provides the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So there's Paul writing about this truth. Now let's see Paul living out this truth in his own life by the Spirit's conviction. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Second Corinthians 12, 7. <clears throat> So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, my grace will get you through this so you'll be able to endure it. Not my grace will get you out of it right away. I wouldn't be a good father if I got you out of it right away. I'm trying to teach you something and grow you into the image of Christ, God might say. So again, verse 9, But he, God, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In other words, boasting in your weaknesses equals relying on God's grace. If you boast in your weaknesses, you've surrendered, right? If you're willing to boast in your weaknesses, You've said, I, am, I can't do this without your grace, Lord. So Paul continues in verse 10, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, the key principle is that God provides not the way out, but the way through it to the glory of his grace. And are you ready for this? This can all be done in the joy of the Spirit. That's the miracle. This can all be done with the joy of the Spirit. Turn to Hebrews 12.1. Hebrews 12.1. When we truly rely on God's grace, He provides for us the peace and joy to get through it. Now, sometimes we don't rely on God's grace like we should, right? <laughs> and we tend to stay miserable or fighting it. But when we truly rely on God's grace, when we say, Lord, your grace is sufficient. I know it is. I'm willing to stay right here if you want me right here, right? Your grace is sufficient. That provides us, he provides us the peace and the joy to get through it. So let's see our Lord first as the example as we compare a couple passages on this. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There it is again, endurance. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy motivated our Lord to do what? Endure the cross. Endure the Father's plan for him. Allah, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And so we aren't to try to sidestep our trials, but rather accept it as the glorious will of God that it is for your life and endure it 
to the glory of his grace. When we endure it, when we find contentment in it, it brings God glory. And even if no one sees you or you think no one sees you, the angels see you. How often we forget that. And that's part of the whole spiritual battle and the glory that we bring God that we'll see the results of in heaven one day. And just as joy motivated our Lord to endure the cross, joy can motivate us to endure whatever he asks of us. Because we know we're doing it for the one who loved us. There's that motivation again. We know we're doing it. We can even be grateful in the situation. Paul became grateful for his weaknesses because he was doing it for the one who loved him, the one who died for him. And how is this possible? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Let's turn to a passage on this in Nehemiah. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 9. How can we make it through? Perspective is everything, right? The joy of the Lord is our strength. If he went through what he went through on the cross, we can go through anything else because nothing's that bad. Nehemiah 8, 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Some of us need to memorize that last part, including myself. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. As believers in the Lord, we don't need to be grieved. We could be perplexed, as the Bible says, maybe, but not grieved, because we have the hope above all hopes in Christ. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength because he intends to see us through every trial and tribulation by grace. He's not going to leave us. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. So just because you don't feel him necessarily in a situation or you don't see a way out of the situation does not mean he's not with you and that he's not going to see you through it and hold your hand through the whole thing. By grace, he always does because he's perfectly faithful to his children. So let the joy of the Lord be your strength. Go to 2 Corinthians 4.1. 2 Corinthians 4.1. This leads us to another very encouraging passage as we live out our lives in the devil's world. This isn't going to be easy. It's going to get harder probably. The devil's world is just spiraling downward. It's not like even staying okay or whatever. It's not staying the same. But God will supply and will not allow us to be tempted beyond where we're able. We just read that. And he's preparing us right now. Why do you have to stay faithful to the word of God? That's how he prepares you to pass the tests. Now, if you skip out on the word of God, you will, you will struggle mightily. But if you prepare yourself now, you're going to be able to handle what he gives you. You will. He'll give you unexplainable peace and joy and wisdom, etc. 2 Corinthians 4 1. Let's start here. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light 
of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There's gratitude, by the way. But, and here's the key, we have this treasure in jars of clay. That's, not, that's what we are, right? We're just jars of clay. We have this treasure, the glory of God and Christ, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Let your light shine before men, right? Let his light in you shine before men. In other words, it's okay for all this stuff to happen because you're never without hope. It's all good and it's all worth it with our faithful God on our side. So here's a key principle that came out on Sunday. Every time we surrender to the Lord, admitting we can't do something on our own, crying out for his help, that is proper worship. That is what he's waiting for from his humble children. For example, we're going to see this in Luke 18, 13. As our dear pastor put it, proper worship is the result of being driven to worship God because of utter reliance on his grace. That's worship. Like, we don't, we think of worship as pious, right? Like, you know, religious. Worship is God help. God help. I can't do this without you. I'm nothing. You're everything. That's worship. And that's relying on his grace, which is what he's waiting for so we can come to the rescue. So we can at the very least give you the power and strength and peace to endure it even joy through the trials. So let's go to one of my favorite parables that illustrates this. Go to Luke 18, 13. And remember the pattern of repentance and faith, this crying out attitude, so to speak, right? Have mercy on me, the sinner. That's the same pattern, not only at salvation, but for our daily deliverance. Lord, save me, the sinner. Have mercy on me, the sinner. I screwed up again, or I'm in a helpless situation. They're persecuting me. Help me, Lord. Luke 18, 13, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. You know what that means? That means God's pleased with him. God's satisfied by that act, not of pious prayer, of crying out for help. This man went to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Exalted. Maybe not right away. Maybe you have to go through the trial and he's going to make you sit on the ash heap for a while so you realize his grace is sufficient, but you will be exalted when you humble yourself this way before God. Isn't that encouraging? To know that God will give us more grace if we ask him? More grace? He wants to give us more grace? To pray, God, help, I can't do it, is exactly what he's waiting for. So that his grace can shine forth in our lives to his glory. When people know how weak you are, that's a great setup for success to God's glory. When people see how weak you are and helpless you are, that's a great situation to be in. 
to bring God glory. Because then you get to rely totally on his grace and you get to watch him deliver you at the right time and everyone goes, wow. Not at you, right? That God used you, the weak one, to bring him glory. It's just all about him. But that's all God's waiting for is us to ask for help. Ask for more grace. So let's come full circle back to being grateful as we started this evening. How about being grateful that the Lord is there for you any and every time you ask Him? Like there's no qualifiers, you know what I mean? When you're humble, when you humble yourself before God and ask for His help, even when you've screwed up, even when it's your fault, when you go to God with a humble attitude, be merciful to me, the sinner, He's there every single time. We're so blessed that his faithfulness reaches to the skies and his love never ends according to his word. And we're told to draw near. Draw near. I love this so much. Turn again to uh, Hebrews 4.16. It's funny how we can't get off of this wonderful verse, but I, I kind of don't want to leave. Because it says so much. It gives us the solution. Hebrews 4.16 Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What do you think that, that tax collector did in the parable? Did he not draw near to the throne of grace? God be merciful to me, a sinner? That's about as raw and as pure as it gets. Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's what God does. But we have to draw near. We have to be humble. And this was compared again to James 4, 8. If you remember, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. When we turn to him for grace, he shows us his grace in ways that we usually don't even expect. And God is very personal, and He wants us to seek that personal contact with Him. So let's go on to the introduction of Christ as our great high priest. This is why we can go to God at any time and ask for help. And we're heard. God hears us because our great high priest is always representing us perfectly to the Father. Go to Hebrews 5.5. 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We saw a few limited passages on this Melchizedek guy. He's kind of mysterious. And how he relates to Christ, how he's a type of Christ, our perfect priest forever. We noted that his priesthood came before the law ever existed, and therefore before the Levitical priests. And this man apparently had preeminence over Abram before he even became a Jew. And this is really shocking when you think about the fact that Abraham is called the father of our faith. If Abram is the father of our faith, then what's Melchizedek? If he's greater than Abram. This is a type of Christ, of course. We also noted that Abram conceded his superior, superiority and preeminence by giving tithes to him. That's quite a show of submission and honor, isn't it? We would have thought it would have been the other way around. This is Abraham, right? I mean, he's still Abram, but this is the one God chose to create a new race of his own people. And on top of that, Melchizedek blessed Abram in Genesis 14, not the other way around as we might expect. The greater one blesses the inferior one. 
So who was this great high priest of God? The key principle from Sunday was Melchizedek is given preeminence over Abraham and ultimately Aaron, the first Levitical high priest. He was appointed by God, not based on his genealogy, like the Levitical priests, they had to be Levites. This wasn't the case with Melchizedek. His life is referred to without a beginning or an end, typifying an eternal priestly ministry like Christ's. This man is mysterious in the scriptures and quite a type of Christ, the great high priest forever. So let's look forward to what we'll learn about him and how he relates to Christ. Let's just read a few more verses here in Hebrews 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So let's just close tonight with something important for us to remember from Sunday. I'm not going to get into all the detail that we ended with on Sunday. That's, that's pastor's baby. We talked this morning. I'm like, I'm glad I'm not a pastor, pastor. Go get him, you know, because there's some challenging things that the Spirit wants them to bring up from time to time, right? I'm just a teacher. I'm just relaying some messages from Sunday. Anyway, um, Here's kind of the main point that we ended with is not all things that took place under the law of Moses started with the law of Moses. We tend to think, right, if it was part of the law, well, that was the law, right? We're no longer under the law, right? We're under grace. But what if the thing that took place under the law is that's not where it started from? What if it started before that? We've seen that such a thing as the priesthood started way before the law with Melchizedek. Way before. We've also seen that tithing started before the law with Abram. And remember, even circumcision started way before the law was ever given. It started with Abram when he became Abraham, the first Jew. These truths, and there are probably others, began hundreds of years before the law was ever given to the Jews. So before we jump to conclusions about the law and what's for today and what's not for today, we must consider what things have always existed. And I, I have the word always in quotes. We have to consider the things that have always existed in the sense that they were around before the law was ever given. If we don't consider that, we might wrongly make the word say something that it doesn't say. A good reminder as we continue to explore what the Spirit has for us in this particular congregation. Amen? All right, let's bow. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, uh, for your word, for your spirit, for teaching us, for bringing us along with your grace and your truth. We ask that you bless us all. Help us cling to your grace completely. Help us ask for your mercy at all times and help us know deep down in our hearts that your grace is sufficient no matter what you ask us to go through or bear. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for the tests and the trials. We ask that you give us the strength and the joy to endure it to your glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.